All right, guys. Chapter two, section two. Hope you're ready. Hope you have paper, workbook if you want it, textbook or ebook open, and a calculator. You're gonna need it, okay? So um, in this section, we start with our math practices. We kind of did last class with basic density or you know switching metric units, and that's kind of what we're gonna do today, but I am gonna show you a different way of doing it. So buckle up, buttercup, because this is stuff we will use all year long. So you're gonna be frustrated, perfectly fine. You're gonna probably miss a few questions. It's okay, nobody, nobody is going to, you know, get sick and die from doing the homework, I promise. Now, we're going to start on page 40. So 40 of your textbook or 40 of your ebook, whichever one you choose. If you want your workbook out, which I'm not super picky about this section, do go back and do some of the concepts, but the way that they ask the questions for the problems, I'm not a real big fan of. I'm gonna show you how to do it, and then I just want you to answer them, but don't stress over walking through every step of their problem solving manner, okay? If you can solve the problem off to the side without going through every single step, I'm perfectly okay with that. So, in your workbook, it's page 19. Now, again, I highly suggest you skim through, look over what we're doing, do your vocab, so pause me now if you wanna go do that, and we're gonna get going. So, screen share. There we go, all right. Section two, scientific notation and dimensional analysis. Don't be scared, dimensional analysis is just what Miss uh, Wright, if you were here for integrated one, she calls it railroad tracks. You've probably seen it before. I call them T-charts because I draw a T when I do it, so that's what I call it. But dimensional analysis is the true term for it. The main idea in this section, scientists use scientific methods to systematically pose and test solutions to questions and assess the results of those tests. That's not the main idea of this section. I copied the wrong one in, my bad. The real main idea, scientists often express numbers in scientific notation and solve problems using dimensional analysis. So what do you know about scientific notation or dimensional analysis besides what I just told you? What do you wanna know? And then come back later and figure out what you learned. Here are the questions that I hope you can answer by the end of this lesson. Why do we use scientific notation to express numbers? What's the point? And number two, how is dimensional analysis used for unit conversion? What's the point of setting it up the way it is? There's a rhyme to the reason, I promise. Vocabulary, quantitative data. As a reminder, that is the numerical information describing how much, how little, how big, how tall, how fast, and so on. So if it's quantitative, it has a number and a unit, okay? So there's going to be some measurement, some number, and then the unit, how did you measure it? What, what were we measuring in? Your new vocabulary, scientific notation, dimensional analysis, and a conversion factor. Gee, might that be used to convert? Okay, we'll come back to that. This is a lot. Scientific notation can be used to express any number, whether it's really, really, really long or really, really, really tiny, as a number between one and 10, which we call the coefficient, and it's multiplied by 10 raised to a power or to an exponent. So take a look. The number of carbon atoms in the Hope Diamond, 4.6 times 10 to the 23rd. Ooh, you're gonna you're gonna come to love that times 10 to the 23rd. This 4.6, whatever comes before the times 10 to the, is called your coefficient. And the 23 is your exponent, okay? So what I want you to do real quick, I want you to pick up your calculator. If it's your phone, that's fine, but you really need to be using like at least a scientific calculator. Um, if you're using your phone, you're going to want to turn it sideways. So make sure that your screen lock is off so you can turn it sideways because sometimes when you're typing these numbers in, it's going to get weird. I want you to do 10 raised to the 23rd. 10 to the 23rd. Maybe you can see that. Notice my calculator is like, no, can't do that. But if I did, oops, not one, 10 
to the six, something smaller, it basically pushes that decimal over. So that's saying 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. Okay, so you know when you multiply by 10, you set a zero. Okay, good. All right, so the trick here is you're gonna count the number of places the decimal point must be moved so that your coefficient falls between one and 10. Okay, so only one number is gonna end up out front over here. The number of places moved equals the value of the exponent. All right, so here's the biggie. Make sure you get this, okay? Count your number of jumps. And then if you move the decimal to the left, so it started off as a big number and it's going to a smaller number, you're gonna have a positive integer. If you're moving your decimal to the right, so it's going from a smaller number to a bigger number, your exponent's gonna be negative, okay? So if you're moving it, basically it becomes, what's it gotta do to get back to the normal number, okay? So remember, if you move left, because it's a big number, you move left, your, your exponent's positive. If you move right, your exponent's negative. And just like we did with the metric units, where does the decimal start? And how many jumps till it ends? I had to jump twice to get it to be 8.0. So that means it's times 10 to the second. So what we're saying here is this is 8.0 times 10 times 10. Well, 10 times 10 is, is 100. 8 times 100 is 800. Now, this is a tiny measurement over here. Oh my goodness. But where's it start and where's it going to end? It's going to end right after this three. So I'm going to jump one, two, three, four. I'm going to jump five times, sorry, kind of messed that up, five times, okay? But it was smaller to start off with, so it's negative. 3.43, bring everything after it. 0.43 times 10 to the negative fifth, okay? Negative fifth. And really what you're doing here is when I say times 10 to the negative, I'm gonna divide by 10 each time. Oh boy. This was a mistake. There we go, one, two, three, four, five. So it's gonna be 3.43, divide by 10, divide by 10, divide by 10, or you're gonna divide by one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. That's an easier way to think of it. Don't stress over that. Can you move the decimal and can you figure out your exponent? That's the question. All right, so let me clear this. Let's keep moving. Now, hang on one second. Okay. Here, let's go ahead and do example problem two. I have these two in the wrong order and I, I don't know why I didn't fix it. But we're going to write these in scientific notation. I want you to say where does the decimal start and where's it going to end? Okay, for each one and then figure out what it is. Go ahead and try both and Pause, and we'll see if we got it right. Okay, so here in this first one, of course, you'll need to write it down, but I'm gonna move my decimal. One, two, three, four, five, six. So it's gonna say 3.92 times 10 to the positive six. And I'm gonna bring my unit with me. It's positive six because it was a bigger number. Okay, and I went to the left. Now the other one, here's my decimal to start. I need it to end right here. So I'm gonna start hopping and then I'm gonna figure out how many hops that was. So we're gonna start at this decimal over here. We're gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And it started off small, so it's gonna be negative eight. I'm gonna write the digits with my decimal between or after the ones place. And I'm gonna bring my units, grams per centimeter cubed. So that's a density. All right, now for your homework, your job is going to be to do all these practice problems. So after we do the example problems that are in the box on page 41, your job will be do, to do the ones underneath it. So 
For number 11, you're going to take the decimal from where it sits and move it to where it belongs. For number 12, you're going to take, uh, take it out of scientific notation. So number 11, I I'm not helping you with. But number 12, I feel like I should help you with. If I'm going backwards, and it's 3.60 times 10 to the fifth seconds, I got to figure out which way to move this. Look at the exponent. Is it big or is it little? If it is positive, that means the number needs to be bigger, okay? It's positive, got to be bigger. I'm going to the right. So I'm going to take 3.60 and I'm going to move it five places to the right. One, two, three, four, five. Put it there. Fill in your holes. So really, my number, and then please make it pretty. We don't like this ugliness. Three, six, zero, 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 zero. Put a comma in for good measure. Bring your units. 360,000 seconds. For part B, you're going to do the same concept, but you're going to go to the left because it's a negative exponent. I guess I'm getting that back. So you're going to go to the left if it's negative. You're going to go to the right if it's positive. You finish up 11 and 12, and then we're going to keep going. Sorry, didn't mean to do that through that. All right, so here we're going to talk about doing math with scientific notation. You do need to write this, guys, okay? If I get too far ahead of you, I'm on page 42 now. But if you're going to add and subtract values in scientific notation, this is the biggie. The exponents must be the same, okay? So this one being times 10 to the 18 and this being times 10 to the 19, I can't have that. I gotta pick one or the other, okay? So to fix it, you're gonna pick whichever one you wanna fix, and then you're gonna move the decimal and change the exponent. So this one has us doing uh, to the 18th. So I'm gonna take this guy, and if I need it to be 18th, I gotta move the decimal one more spot. That changes this from 17 to 18, because it, it, it was bigger than it should have been, okay? If I did it the other way, if I were to change the one on the left, um, I would take this guy and I would go to the right one and take one away, so this would be 17. We're not doing that in this example, but that's how you would. Um, let's be honest, guys, you can use your calculator for these. So here, if I did this, that should be an eight here, then I could just add or subtract my coefficient and my exponent stays the same. So that's adding and subtracting. Get the coefficients to be the same. Oops, we already did that. Multiplying and dividing is what we're going to do far more often because most of the relationships in chemistry are multiplying or dividing. If you're going to do that, you're going to multiply your coefficients and then you're gonna add your exponents for multiplying, okay? For dividing, you're gonna divide the coefficients and then subtract the exponent. So I don't quite remember which math you hit this stuff in, but let's look at these examples together. So if I'm doing 4.6 times 10 to the 23rd times two times 10 to the negative 23rd, I'm gonna say 4.6 times two, which is 9.2. And then I'm gonna say 23 plus a negative 23 is zero. So really, my answer there is just 9.2, okay? Next, if I'm dividing, I'm gonna say nine, divide by three is three. And then I'm gonna say seven minus a negative three is 10. So seven minus negative three is the same as plus a positive, so it's 10. Up here is 23 plus a negative 23, so that just cancels out, that's just zero. All right, um, again, anything raised to a power of zero is equal to one. So that explains why I said what I said. All right, guys, I want you to look down and we're just going to do, I want you to do number 13 in the practice section. And then for number 14, 
for number 14, I want you to pick two of them. You may pick two to do for your homework, okay? Um, when you get to 15 and 16, I, you can do that. I think you can do that. So I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna say to go ahead and do 15 and 16, okay? Part of your homework. Before you do your homework, let's do some practice. Example problem three. We are multiplying. Oops. We are. Yeah, we're multiplying here. I thought I skipped something. So I'm going to say two times three. What is that? That is six. Hopefully you knew that. And since I'm multiplying, I'm going to add these values together. Guys, what's three plus two? Five, good. We don't have any units, so you just leave it like that. And then I'm gonna divide. Nine divided by three is three. Eight minus negative four is the same as plus a positive, so that's 12. Oh, positive 12, just kidding, positive 12. Oops. Okay, now you're gonna work on your homework, but before you do that, um, or you can go ahead and do that on your homework page, which is just a sheet of paper. You're gonna do 11 through 16, like we talked about. You can skip two of them on 14, I'll let you choose. But I am going to go ahead. So pause the video now if you wanna go work on those, okay? All right, guys, dimensional analysis. Um, you've probably heard them called railroad tracks. I call them T-charts. This is a way to convert units or a way to set up math problems so that I don't have to keep moving decimals. I don't have to figure out if I multiply or divide. I can just lay it out in this chart and it does the math for me. It tells me what to multiply and divide and I don't have to worry about it. If you'll buy into it and you'll trust me, if you can figure out how to do these problems now, when we get down the road to stoichiometry and to gas laws, this will be so easy, okay? We're going to work on this for a long time, but I, I wanna tell you it is confusing, okay? It is, it, it's one of those things that takes a few steps, but once you get it, you're gonna be fine. All right, so here's your next definition. A conversion factor is a ratio. So that means I'm gonna have a fraction, right? We're gonna use a fraction that shows two equivalent values that have different units. So I want you to think of something that's equal to something else. Like if I were to say a dozen, a dozen is what? Well, it's 12 of whatever. So one dozen donuts is equal to 12 donuts. So a conversion factor for that would be one dozen donuts is equal to 12 donuts. Or I could flip it. It's the same thing. Isn't 12 donuts still a dozen donuts? And I'll explain uh, how you know which one to put on top. Minutes and seconds. How many seconds are in a minute? 60 seconds in one minute. Or I can put one minute on top. If two things are equal, they mean the same, or they're mathematically equal, you can put them in these conversion factors and you just kind of arrange them in a certain way. Let's go see how we do it. They said eggs. I went with donuts. I like donuts. Percentages are also good conversion factors. So if I say something is 70% ethyl alcohol, like you know our Germax is supposed to be, it's 70 parts alcohol to 100 parts Germax. 70 out of 100, right? 70 out of 100. Okay, so how do we use these? 
So there, th this little saying is, is crazy. If I'm going to buy, say, a Coca-Cola product that comes in eight packs, or Gatorade sometimes comes in eight, and I need to know how many of these packs of Gatorade to get if I'm going to have a party with 32 people. Well, we're not having one of those right now. But if I were to have a party with 32 people coming and they're all going to pick up a Gatorade and they're all going to socially distance and wear a mask, how many eight packs do I have to buy? So you start with what you know. You don't know eight packs, so don't start there. That's the difference between Ms. what Miss Wright used to do and what I do. I write down what I know. I, have, I know 32 people or I'm given. That's part of the problem. 32 people. And then I say, well, each person is probably going to want two because I'm going to buy the mini ones. So each person is going to want two bottles. And there are eight bottles in every one eight pack. So I need to buy eight of the eight packs, right? Some of you are going, that's way too hard. If they're all going to have two, then 32 times two is 64. That means I need eight of them. You're doing the same thing that I just said, but I'm writing it out. Notice 32 people, and then it's two bottles per person. So per is the dividing line. And there is one eight pack per eight bottles or eight bottles per eight pack. So we use it a little conversion factor. We use that ratio. Notice people on top, person on bottom, bottles on top, bottles on bottom. If it's top and bottom, it crosses out. So that determines which way I write in that conversion factor. It has to cancel. The only units or terms left are the ones that I wanted. Has to be top and bottom. Then what do I do? Well, technically you're going to multiply 32 times 2 over 1 and then multiply it by 1 8. That's a little confusing. If it's on the top, you multiply it. Any numbers on the bottom, you divide by. So 32 times 2 is 64 times 1 is still 64, so that's on top. And Divided by one is 64. Divided by eight is eight. Okay, you can do it all at the same time. I'm fine with that. You can do it step by step. I'm fine with that. Just remember if the values are on the top, you multiply. The values are on the bottom, you divide. Let's keep going. Oh, I love this problem. Yes, I'm a nerd. You'll be all right. So, Example problem four, if you get lost, if you get lost, oh, hold on. We need to stop. We need to do something a little different. Just hang on one second, please. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, something that I want to write down real quick. I want us to um, do a couple of simple problems. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to help you with your homework. So jump down, save some space. We're going to go to number 17 if you haven't started at all. And we're going to work on that together. Okay. Number 17, what you're going to do in this section. For part A, I need a 16% by math salt solution. So remember, percentages are out of 100. So I know it's 16 out of 100. And if it's by mass, I'm going to put grams in, or kilograms, doesn't matter. That's your conversion factor. For every 100 grams, 16 grams are whatever salt that we're talking about. The other conversion, I just flip it, depending on what I need. Okay, so here, um, it's gram salt per gram solution, and I'm going to shorten it, sorry. Part over whole, so salt over solution, or if I flipped it, it's salt out of the total solution. All right, so you work on the other. You've got a density and a speed. Just, just keep in mind, it says grams per milliliter. It looks like this, and the value goes with the unit it's next to, okay? Okay, number 18. I'm going to help you with part A. What conversion factors are needed to convert nanometers to meters? Okay, I told you you didn't necessarily have to have this. So in your textbook, I want you to flip back. We don't need to know nanometers just yet. But I want you to, to look at it because you can tell what it is. Okay, so you need to go back to page 33. 
and you'll see that one meter is equal to one times 10 to the negative ninth nanometers, okay? So again, if they're equal, I just put them in a fraction. Okay. All right, now let's look down and we're going to look at number 19. On number 19, I'm gonna do A with you. And then I want you to choose two more. I would strongly suggest maybe not doing the ones that I told you to skip over. So don't do part F, you're not gonna to wanna to do that. But let's do part A. 360 seconds, and I gotta to go to milliseconds. Okay, so here we're going from seconds to milliseconds. So we're here and we're going to here. So technically I'm gonna move my decimal three points to the right, and that's how you check yourself, okay? So my decimal starts here, keep that in mind. But we're gonna do a dimensional analysis style. So remember, this is 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. So that means that there are a thousand milliseconds in one second. This becomes my conversion factor. I have to put seconds on the bottom, so they'll cancel. And then I just plug in the values I've figured out. Again, we're just multiplying by a thousand, so I'm gonna move that decimal three points over. And I'm gonna put my new unit that's left. Okay. Um, number 20 is gonna be fun. You got this. Just know that you know one year and you're working your way to seconds. Okay, be careful. It can't don't use months. Months is not the way to go. Okay. All right, so this one's a little bit harder and it'll help you with that number 20. We're going to do something you've never used before. So it's a really good way to, to check your understanding. In ancient Egypt, a small distance were measured in Egyptian cubits. A cubit is equal to seven palms. One palm was equal to four fingers. If one finger is equal to 18.75 millimeters, Convert six Egyptian cubits to meters. Are you ready? Before I do anything, I was given six cubits. And then I'm gonna draw my line. I'm cheating because I never draw straight lines. But I need to figure out what I know, okay? I know cubits needs to be on the bottom. Well, where did I find out about a cubit? An Egyptian cubit, so one of them, was equal to what? Seven palms. So I used those as a conversion factor. Good, I'm done with cubits, it's gone. So what do I know about palms? Well, I know it's gotta end up down here. And I know it's my hand, but a palm is equal to four fingers. Do they not have thumbs? I don't know. So one palm is equal to four fingers. Good, palms are gone. I'm in fingers now. If one finger, and what's one finger equal to? 18.75 millimeters. Good, I'm in millimeters now. We're trying to get to meters. Meters have to be on top. So millimeters have to be on bottom. And you're going, oh my gosh, she's gonna say it again. Yes, she is. Kangaroos, hop, down. Mountains, drinking chocolate milk. And remember, mountains is whatever I need it to be, so here's meters, okay? Meters versus millimeters. It's one, two, three hops. One, two, three hops, three millimeters, because it's the baby, equals one meter. And I'm gonna plug that in. You'll kind of remember that as time goes on, plus there's a conversion on the back of your green sheet that says one liter is equal to a thousand milliliters. 
the same for meters. One meter is equal to a thousand millimeters. Uh, same with grams. One gram is equal to a thousand milligrams. It's always the same. That's why the metric unit's so good. Nerd alert. Okay. Mark out millimeters. And we have to math now. Grab your calculator. Doesn't have to be this calculator. You can use your phone. But again, if it gets really big and you can't type it in, turn your phone sideways. All right, clear out all my junk. I am starting with six. Every single time you do this, you start with six. And you're gonna multiply by every number on the top. And then I'm gonna divide by the numbers on the bottom, which ones don't count. So I'm just gonna divide by a thousand. Listen as I say this, as I type it in, okay? I'm gonna type six times seven times four times 18.75. This is what I'm typing in. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and hit enter. I get 3,150, and I'm just gonna divide by 1,000. You could divide by one all day long, it's not gonna do any good. The value I get is 3.15. 3.15. That's not really how I would answer this, but we'll go over that later. 3.15 meters, okay? 3.15 meters. Now, make sure you circle your answers when you're doing these. It's not always gonna lay everything out for you. Some of the information you're gonna have to figure out, but remember, must cancel, so the unit must show up again on the bottom. And whatever I know it's equal to goes on top. And then you just keep moving until you get to the unit you want, which is meters. Okay? Let's look at 21, please. Let's look at 21. Again, we're on page 46 now. Let's go look at 21. I want to help you with this one because it has something on top and on bottom. And then 23 is a challenge, so I won't count it against you, but I do want you to try it. But we're gonna do 21 together. It says, the speedometer at the right displays a car's speed in miles per hour. What is the car speed in kilometers per hour? If one kilometer is equal to 0 .06, sorry, 0 0.62 miles. So I know, oh boy, I'm gonna say that that is 65 miles per one hour. So normally we would write it like this, miles per hour, that means miles per hour, okay? I really need you to start thinking of the word per as being your dividing line. All right, awesome, I've got miles per hour. You have to get this to kilometers per hour. Well, what am I gonna do? They told me my conversion factor. I need miles on the bottom and I need kilometers on the top. Leave the hour alone. We don't need to change that guy, okay? It's supposed to be in per hour at the end. If you do have to change that one, I'll show you how to do it. Point six two miles is one kilometer. So miles canceled out. My units now are gonna be kilometers, and don't forget your hour, he's still there. But what you're gonna do in your calculator at this point is you're gonna say 65. I don't need to worry about the ones. I'm gonna say 65 divided by 0.62. See it? 0.62 is on the bottom, I don't care about the ones. Oof, it's pretty big. It should be 104. 0.84, and we'll go over how many digits should I be writing down next class, okay? So 104.84 or 105 something along those lines, okay? You go ahead and you work on 22. Remember, you're starting at 24 hours and you're working back to seconds. So how many what's are in an hour? How do I get to seconds? Make sure your units cancel. All right, guys. Let me close this bad boy and we're going to go back to this. No, I can try and do that. All right. Oh, wow. 
Remember your essential questions for this section? Why use scientific notation to express numbers? How did it help? How did, you know, I went from this long old decimal to something real short? Think about that. Um, and how is dimensional analysis used? What was the concept? Okay, play it out for me. Why did I, why did I set everything in this chart? What was the point of doing that? How could that help us? All right, guys. That's it for this section. Y'all be good, and I will talk to you next time.